What's good, super friends? It's your tío Pepe from the mean streets of Sunland Park. Hey, this is the que quiere tres de tripitas y tres de buche. Sorry about that. Doing my little side hustle here. I've always had the reputation of being the cool uncle. You know, the one that lets you taste his old cough syrup when mom and dad aren't looking. So I always hook you up. I'm back to hook you up again, fam. For only $2 a month, you can skip these annoying ads and get our episodes ad-free and a week early. You'll also be the first to know when I release my MFTs. You've heard of NFTs? These are MFTs, baby. Mexican fungible tokens, vato. The first ones of Rocky Estar y Super Muñeco will be out soon. Shoot me a DM on the DL. Ain't none of Isela and Elena's business, if you know what I mean. We'll also send you stickers a few times a year and shout you out on our show. Link is in the show notes or check us out on patreon.com slash technically a conversation. Living in a cave, not gonna lie, sounds pretty cool. For over 30 years, a monk, Giovanni Maria de Agostini, lived in caves all over Europe, Brazil, and America. He was so admired that he gathered a following most every country he went to. So much so that he still has a small amount of followers who make pilgrimages to his old cave home in New Mexico to this day. But why would someone choose to live like this in a day when homes are available? Get the details next on Technically a Conversation. Greetings, super friends. Welcome to another episode of Technically a Conversation. Here, we like to share an interesting topic or story with each other, which we've recently learned and hope you find it interesting too. I'm one half of your host today, Isela. Joining me as always is Jose. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good. Not terrible. Came back from vacation and my days are all mixed up. I don't know what day is today. It's kind of like one of those things. (laughs) Yeah, that's just a typical day for me, honestly. So... (laughs) <laughs> oh, nice. You're like, what's up? What's down? What's today? Yeah. How was your vacation? It was so relaxing. Slept in almost every day, like one should on vacation. Nice. The weather. Oh, my God. I got to escape this over 100 degree weather. And I want to say it was like as high as maybe 82. That was the high. In Alaska? <laughs> In Alaska, <laughs> that crazy climate change. It was, it was in Portland, Oregon. Oh, okay, cool. How are things here? You were holding down the the fort. <laughs> mm, same. It's been in the hundreds the past couple of weeks, which hasn't been fun. No. But um, I mean, I guess after living here for so long, I'm kind of used to it. Yeah. As long as your AC is not going out, right? Let's knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, knock on wood for sure, because that would not be good. No, not one bit. Yeah, I heard that um, there were places in Las Cruces and uh, the lower valley in El-, in El Paso that were without electricity right now. <gasps> so I'm sure that's not great. That part does strike me as odd, just because we're not on that fucked up <laughs> Abbott side of the Texas grid. <laughs> so I wonder if this is still putting a strain on, you know, maxing out their AC is putting a strain on our grid as well. It's possible. Here in Southern Park, we're still on the El Paso electric. And we got uh, something saying that they're going to have one of those things where they control your temperature today. I want to say it was from four to six or something like that. Luckily, I was at home for, or I was at work for one of those hours. So I didn't really get to experience that. But yeah, when I got home, it was like maybe like 83, 84 degrees inside. So I was like, yeah, fuck that. I'm turning on the AC. There's no way I can record a podcast in 84 degree weather. For sure. Yeah, you'd be all grumpy. Or maybe that's why that makes sense. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's so mean. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm grumpy to begin with. Now imagine me in a puddle of my own sweat, <laughs> just <laughs> marinating. <laughs> I wouldn't say you're grumpy. I would just say sometimes you're just very unenthused. Also, this is coming from someone who's like easily excitable. I'm like, oh my God, what do you mean cupcakes? And I don't even like cake and shit. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm very jaded is what it is. Uh, you know, life can be hard. I get it. Sure. I'm here to point out the silver lining wherever you need it. <laughs> that goes for you two super friends. <laughs> 
So when we first became friends, I remember you had to remind me pretty often that you would only do about one social event a week. Has that changed at all? <laughs> do you still enjoy your solitude? Yeah, I mean, it's about the same. I, I think it was two a month. And I think that you and I kind of overdid it. And sometimes we were hanging out like every week. But now with, um, I mean, after the pandemic, especially, I'm back to maybe two a month. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm kind of glad I pushed you out of your comfort zone. You had good times. Come on. We did good things. I did. But I feel like during the pandemic is when I really shined. And I got to just stay home <laughs> all the time. <laughs> You're like, this is me in all my glory. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and it's weird because once I do finally go out, I do have fun. It's just getting the motivation to leave the house. I was listening to this podcast, this lady, Esther Perel, even she was saying how, you know, even in relationships, like, you know, people seem to forget that introverts still can be social. They're social battery just might be shorter than other people, you know? I get it. Yeah. So keeping with that idea, do you think you would like to live in a cave? Mm, I wouldn't go that far, but... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're like, slow down. <laughs> but I think I'm pretty hermetic as it is now. Uh, so um, I think I have all the uh, benefits, I guess, if you could say, of living in a cave with the comforts <laughs> of living in a home. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you really do. Yeah, you have your, hey, this is where I live and don't come over unless I ask you and, you know, like that kind of thing. I get it. That's really nice. <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> do compare my house to a cave, though, because I have all the windows with those blackout curtains. So when you walk in there, it's like being at Carlsbad Caverns or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you almost expect bats to fly out or something. <laughs> <laughs> you just need your own personal uh, Bruce Wayne or not Bruce Wayne. What's that guy? The butler guy? Alfred. Alfred. <laughs> you go. Yeah. You need your own personal butler. No, but then you wouldn't be living a life of solitude. Yeah. We, we can never win. That could become a problem. <laughs> I remember one of my friends used to tease me. She said, I don't know, man. Like, I imagine you having people tied up in your basement or something. I'm like, I'm not the BTK killer or anything. Plus, I don't have a basement. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, that's just my forbidden room, silly. Yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> it's like, where are those screams coming from? So I told oh, them to no. shut up. Don't worry. That's Don't worry. They're going to get it once you leave. <laughs> All you, yeah. <laughs> that's so awful. You're like, damn it. You mean I haven't soundproofed that room yet? Shit. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, I'm totally kidding. Oh, I know, right? People are going to start <laughs> dispatching <laughs> emergency vehicles to your house. <laughs> you see the fucking NSA come through the windows or whatever. I know. <laughs> Last month, my sister-in-law, Marissa, she was telling me about this lore, if you will, that she had heard about a cave that is really close to where my brother and, and where she, they live in these mountains in southern New Mexico. She told me small parts that she could kind of remember. And she was telling my dad and I, and I was intrigued enough. And of course, I asked all these follow-up questions like, oh my God, is that really true? Or, and then <laughs> let me tell you what she cleverly replied. I don't know. That's why I want you to do an episode on it. <laughs> so someone, <laughs> she says, so someone could do the research and just tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marissa, here's your research. You're welcome. And also thank you because I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Doing your homework. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> But I did find it rather intriguing. Hopefully you do too. I'm instantly curious. Yeah. We're going to be chatting about a monk from Italy who lived a life of solitude in a cave in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico. And this was in the 1860s. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Side note, he had a rather cool beard. Kind of gives me these like slightly... David Letterman, if Dave was like a wizard vibes, you got to see it. <laughs> I'll send you a picture. <laughs> so get ready to take a vow of poverty and celibacy for the next 30 minutes or so, because this is our episode of the Italian hermit monk who lived in a New Mexico cave. <laughs> All right. This comes from a Smithsonian article, The Inspiring Monk Who Lived in a Cave from December 2019. Of course, link in the show notes. Show notes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? We did talk about uh, us 
I don't remember if it was you and I or or if it was uh, Elena and I that we were talking about if people said show notes when we would say it. And uh, Eric, he did reply and he said that he does say show notes as well. <laughs> I saw his comment. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that when there's like a big cacophony of everyone going, show notes, you know, <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> that's the dream, at least. Yeah, it's living in my head for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what up with this monk, right? Who this? Uh, <laughs> his name is Giovanni Maria de Agostini. Mamma mia. I'm just kidding. Obviously not that last part. <laughs> he was born in 1801. Clearly by the name, we can deduce that he was Italian from his writings or his diary that he had left. We do see that he was already starting to lean towards a life of solitude from the surprisingly young age of five years old. Like, what does that make you think? That he probably also had an abusive father. Oh, no. (laughs) It made me seriously question, like, what kind of a shit show was going on in 1806? I was like, what was happening in Italy? (laughs) You know what I mean? This poor kid. Or maybe his mom bothered him a lot, right? Like, he was like, ah, shit. Here comes this lady again with the tickling. I just, I wish I lived alone. (laughs) (laughs) That's interesting, though. I feel like everything was glorious at five years old. Do you remember five years old? Not very vividly, no. I know that I've, uh, you know, mentioned family life a lot here, so I won't retell those (laughs) stories everybody's tired of hearing about but (laughs) but even at five years old things were like shitty yeah i mean as far as i can remember i've always had those memories oh okay and just thinking about that so i think those of us that are kind of hermetic maybe subconsciously because i never really thought about it until right now but maybe subconsciously like the people that we trust the most they prove to us that they i guess not that they were not trustworthy but maybe that we should be cautious of them. And I think that's why it's hard for us to develop those type of uh, strong relationships with others, you know? I mean, I have friends and everything. I'm not a complete fucking hermit, you know, but... (laughs) I know that. I'm not like those people that like, oh, like every day, like I hang out with like different friends and all that, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get that completely. And that completely makes sense too, because there's a reason why people keep other people at arm's distance. I mean, everyone is dysfunctional in some way. If you think you're not, ask your very honest friend. (laughs) (laughs) So somewhere in his 30s, this Giovanni person joined the Maronite Church in Rome. Maronite Christians are actually, or well, where they actually started, I should say. It's somewhere like in where Lebanon is today. It is also found in Syria, Israel, and Jordan. So that's where that is still found today. This is why it was rather atypical for Agostini to be a Marianite in Italy. He was drawn to it because he wanted to model his life after a third century Marianite monk who lived alone for 20 years. And then he founded the first Christian monastery. So he was like, what? That's a dream. (laughs) Sounds crazy for me, but I mean, okay, to each their own. (laughs) Even for me, it does sound crazy to not be around any people for 20 years. Right? I know. So here's my first question, or my second question, really. If you lived alone for 20 years, what would be like the top three things you'd miss besides family, of course? I'm probably going to restaurants because I do like to go out to eat a lot. So I would definitely miss that. Yeah, yeah. And that's about it, I think. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Family and restaurants. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, definitely family, definitely friends, people that are close to me. But as far as me going out to a social place, because, you know, despite me having a whiskey pick every other week, I am not somebody that normally goes to bars or anything like that. So. Okay. No, that's definitely nice. I get it. I like a little surprising dish here or there. I can tell you I definitely wouldn't miss going to Walmart every weekend or whatever to go buy groceries that I would definitely not miss. Yeah, fighting it out, duking it out with everybody in pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, look, let me keep it 100. I know I talk a lot, but I'm not like a yapper who likes to hear her own voice. Like, I actually like to hear other people's opinions or just like an understanding how they think. Of course, you remember the whole drive back from Dallas. I don't even think we listened to one song because we were all just like weedy weedy, to clarify for non-Spanish speakers. 
Weedy weedy is just like Spanish slang for chit chatting, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty good at that. I think. I think that once I start, especially if it's a topic that I'm very interested in, it's hard to shut me up. I'll talk about sea monkeys and comic books all day. I feel sea monkeys. <laughs> quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would definitely miss sushi, chatting with other people. And then like, I think, no lie, if I lived in a cave, I'd miss a toilet. Like I would really miss a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> the world would be your toilet, Isela. <laughs> oh, I don't want the world to be my toilet. <laughs> For this reason, I don't think I would dig this seclusion monk life. I do think my own home is like, it's a good little escape from the scary outsides. <laughs> But I think as Mexicans, we have big families. So we have enough parties going on and all that stuff. So we kind of get the best of both worlds. We get a whole lot of exposure to a lot of people. And then we get to kind of retreat into our respective homes. Yeah, for sure. So Giovanni's dream came true as he would travel somewhere, anywhere, really, find a cave and just be this zero carbon footprint monk living his best life, I guess. <laughs> He went all over Europe, South America. Get this. He crossed the Andes twice. Oh, man. <laughs> That's so crazy. Maybe he just loved mountains and caves. Maybe that was his true passion. I just think he liked to do things alone, I guess. And then this is like almost as tall as the Himalayas. This is insane for him to do that alone. I don't know. He also canoed down the South America's major rivers. Damn. South America, I think there's like big pythons and I don't know what's really big there, but like I think of those really big snakes. Absolutely not. Like he should have really been the patron saint of extreme sports. You know what I mean? What He should have been drinking like this, his version of moonshine or something like this. Maybe that's how he started moonshine. It's like the Red Bull version of moonshine. <laughs> yeah, no, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, that's too extreme, right? Yeah, I couldn't imagine doing something like that by myself because I would at least want somebody to tell my family <laughs> that I got eaten by a giant snake or something. <laughs> You're like, tell them I went out in a cool way. I'm just kidding. <laughs> People in the community knew of him whenever he would kind of start to find a new place to live. And people said that he was known to be really, really smart and well-read, which obviously really smart makes sense because he was kind of traversing by himself, probably just by moonlight or something. <laughs> this is most likely why he had a large following in the Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul. This didn't sit well with the government. You know how they hate when people try to be smart and charming, I guess. <laughs> so when we come back from our break... We'll find out why he got arrested. Yeah, I'm curious too. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Obsessively Intrigued, the podcast where we dive deep into the passions that fuel our obsessions. We're your host, Bunny. And Lexel. Your guides on this journey into the heart of all things tantalizing and captivating. We're here to explore the hidden gems of pop culture. Each episode is a ticket into a realm where curiosity knows no bounds. We're not just your host, we're your fellow seekers. Because let's face it, we're all a bit obsessive about something. And here, that's not just okay, it's celebrated. So, if you're ready to unplug from the ordinary, and dive into the extraordinary. You're, You're in, in the, the right, right place. place. Let's hop into it. This is Obsessively Intrigued. Hello, and welcome to our podcast. In season one, we'll be exploring NBC's TV show Hannibal, where we are revisiting and sharing our thoughts about the show. Join us as we dissect the complex characters, unravel the intricate plot lines, and explore the dark psychology behind this gripping series. Follow us on Instagram at Obsessively Intrigued, Twitter at Obsy Intrigued, that's O-B-S-Y-I-N-T-R-I-G-U-E-D, or visit our website, www.obsessivelyintrigued.com. We'll, we'll see, see you in, in the, the Circle of Obsession. Hello, I'm Joe Landry. And I'm Laurie Olford. And we are the hosts of Alien Talk Podcast. It's a show where we discuss all things concerning aliens and UFOs, 
and where we push the very limits of our understanding about the concept of extraterrestrial life and paranormal phenomena. Yeah, we set out to seek the truth and find the facts pertaining to highly discussed issues about the ancient astronaut theory, the contemporary thinking in the field of ufology, and even matters involving the supernatural and the miraculous. With each episode, we delve deeply and systematically into fascinating discussions that surround such topics. It's an insightful podcast for insightful minds. We're two Arizona police detectives and former Christian ministers who are well-versed both in the studies of the Bible and in the methods of analytical investigation. We take what we know about obtaining sound evidence to solve a case and apply it to the pursuit of discovering possible truths that pertain to the existence of aliens, as well as to some of the mysteries of our universe. So if you want to hear the intellectual side to the questions about UFOs, the hypotheses of extraterrestrial civilizations dwelling on Earth in the ancient past and to humanity's place in the grand scheme of the cosmos, all as seen through science and religion, then check out Alien Talk Podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. And let your quest for knowledge take you to places you never thought you could go. And like we always say on the show, stay curious. And we're back. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> How was your break? <laughs> Good. Just sitting here quietly, imagining that I'm living in a cave instead of a home. <laughs> <laughs> Are you imagining where you would put all your um, Funko Pops or your Pop Funkos? I don't know. What, what's first? Pop, Pop Funko? Funko Pop? Well, that's the great debate. <laughs> what came first? The Funko or the Pop? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Funko Pops. <laughs> Oh, Funko Pop. I don't know those things. Okay. Yeah. Where would you put all those things? Damn it. I think if I was going into a cave, honestly, I would feel like at that point, I just gave up on life. So I don't even think that I would bother. <laughs> That's true. I don't know why I even thought about that. You're like, girl, where am I going to take a shit is a better question. <laughs> That's so gross. Yeah. I'll strap my toilet to my back <laughs> and take that with me. <laughs> oh, my God. As much as you love your bidet, too, are you mad? Can you imagine? You're like, just give a little squirt a roo. No, that's a automatic non starter for me. <laughs> and it's funny because when I went on my trip to Albuquerque, I think that's the longest that I've ever been without my bidet. And oh my God, it's awful going back to toilet paper. I think after the first wipe, I was already like chafed. Just because no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not used to wiping anymore. Right. <laughs> You're like, well, just call me Dingleberries. Apparently. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so gross. Oh, the first day that I was there that I had to use the restroom, after I finished, I jumped in the shower. <laughs> oh, my God. You can't shower every time you go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's so funny. I was about to ask you, too, like, if you now have to be like super bougie where you book hotels because like now you need a bidet because you're accustomed to bidets. I feel like I'm going to have to start being like that. Yeah. Maui, how things have changed when we stayed at that murder hotel. <laughs> <laughs> With the guy that was high off the fumes of ramen or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, all I always smelled. It's like burnt ramen. That's nobody wants to smell that. It's <laughs> <That was> terrible. <laughs> anyway, before we left off, we were talking about how lovely Giovanni got arrested. And here is why he got arrested Brazil, the government itself, were saying that he, quote unquote, encouraged great fanaticism about himself. And that's why they arrested him. And just straight banished him. <laughs> Can you believe that? That's so weird. I know. That's really extreme. Yeah, it sounds like those weird laws where it's like, you're not allowed to carry a rabbit with you on Sundays or something where you're like, why the fuck is this a law or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> what was going on back in the day Yeah, with rabbits on Sundays? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so poor guy, after he got banished from Brazil, in 1861, he went to Mexico and after attracting another good size following again, the government threw him into an insane asylum. It's so crazy. Like the people loved him. The governments really disliked him. I don't know. Then some officials had him deported to 
Havana, Cuba for five months. <laughs> Dude, he's not even from Havana. <laughs> That's so weird. Were they afraid that he was going to start like a revolution or something? I guess starting like a cult or something. I don't know. Some kind of weird uprising, I guess. Maybe, uh, maybe a revolution. I don't know. That's just craziness. Yeah, that is very strange. But I guess he did not like Cuba because homie got on a steamship. He went to New York, then walked 370 miles to Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> he was like Forrest Gump before Forrest, like a mini forest. He was Woodland Gump. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly, he received a less than welcoming response there. And I guess that polite Canadian trait hadn't started yet in the... Uh, I guess that didn't start until the 1900s then or something. <laughs> His journals showed that he said that the cold of the North was not just in the air. It was in their hearts. And Giovanni admitted, they distrusted me and ran away from me. It was the saddest period of my life. It's kind of sad, right? Yeah, it sounds like modern day America almost. I know. I know. <laughs> Everybody distrusts everyone there, yeah. Yeah, especially foreigners. Oh, God, I know. He also added, my ragged clothes and mean appearance did not appeal to the Canadians. He toyed with the idea of returning to Italy, but instead chose to explore Western America. He joined a wagon train in 1863. Being that the monk he was, he refused to take space on a wagon, and he didn't sleep inside a tent either. When they arrived in New Mexico, he found himself a nice little cave where he called home. The cave is right outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he would walk to Las Vegas, New Mexico to attend church. When I Googled it, they were like 192 miles apart. Holy shit. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> I know. So was that like four hours or something? Or how long did it take him to, I mean, four hours, four days? Must have been. It said the drive alone takes three hours. Like, that's insane. The community was so impressed with his devotion that people began to make pilgrimages to his home or cave or whatever you want to call it. Some of these visitors claimed that the hermit monk cured some of their ailments. Do you find this surprising? Yeah, kind of. And I guess I kind of want some more details on that if you have them. I don't have any details. This is just what people were claiming. But it just sounds like they were elevating him to this like Jesus level. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> But he died in 1869 after someone or some group attacked him. Giovanni was found with a crucifix in his hand. And people still go up to his cave as uh, pilgrimages, like still every year. It's called Hermit Peak. They even renamed it Hermit Peak. Isn't that crazy? That's super crazy. Did they leave the body there or something? Or No, no I don't think they <laughs> left the body there. <laughs> but that was where they found him in 1869. Pobrecito. I don't know who attacked him. Probably the government. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to start rumor. Sorry. I'm just kidding. I wonder if he was like those birds that would like decorate the outside of the cave. You know, the, the birds that decorate like the little nest. And they put all these shiny things to attract mates or whatever. I wonder if he did that to attract followers or something. Well, I guess he didn't want a mate, but I guess. Well, no, he didn't even have to attract followers. Or children, since he was a priest. Maybe he was trying to attract children. Oh, my God. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> he sounds like he might have actually been one of the good ones. Um, I don't know. But people really liked how dedicated he was. They said he was really smart and people just started following him. I guess it really is like in the movie Forrest Gump. I don't know if you remember. He just starts running and all these people just start running with him. Yeah, I do remember that. And I always thought that was really strange because I don't think I would join some random person who was just running or something. <laughs> I mean, first of all, would we really join anybody running? <laughs> no, no. that <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> I found it very, very interesting. I had no idea about this guy. My brother did say that he also had lived for a moment in the caves right outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico. So stay tuned. I'm going to head up there on Saturday morning to see if I could take some pictures. If I find that's true, I'll definitely send them so you can post them. Okay, sounds good. We'll definitely put it in the show notes on Patreon because they do allow us to post pictures in those show notes. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I have really short stories to share with you because it was on a similar vein and I thought these were too good not to share. So indulge me for a quick moment. This is from an Oddity Central article 
Russian real life Batman wages war on Moscow criminals. What? What? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so this was back in 2016, but it said that there was a guy who waged war against the local drug dealers in Moscow, specifically in Kimki. He claimed to have civilly arrested 40 criminals at the time the article was released. And you're probably wondering, like, yeah, but most importantly, was he wearing the costume, right? <laughs> he was. He was wearing his own costume or was it a Batman costume? It was a Batman costume. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? They said the, the sighting was um, from a taxi driver who saw this man going into some like shady place that was known for all this drug dealing. After the Batman guy <laughs> went in, he reported to hear all this like ruckus. <laughs> I'm picturing it sounds just like out of like a movie or something. <laughs> but he heard some kind of ruckus and where like things were being thrown and broken. <laughs> and he <laughs> said he saw some kind of smoke bomb thing go off. And then he just like disappeared into thin air like a... Like Batman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I imagine him in one of those like ill-fitting uh, party city costumes that yeah. like, everybody that wears them always has like a camel toe. <laughs> so I imagine <laughs> so I imagine them being like kind of tight and like ill-fitting with the fucking cape just tied around the neck or something. <laughs> That's so gross. Yeah. On a similar vein, in 2012, so Slovakia, there was a 26-year-old man, Zoltan Kahari, who also took it upon himself to clean up the streets. He aids the elderly, but he does call the police when uh, something is looking a little sus. And yes, of course, he was also wearing his Batman costume, which he made himself. So, like, even imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining, like, the ears weren't even, like, symmetrical. <laughs> I don't even know what to imagine, really. Are there any pictures of these guys, or is it just people that have uh, reported to see them? No, no pictures, just an oddity central article, which we will, of course, link in the show notes. Show notes. But apparently, bef yeah. <laughs> before he cleaned up his own act, this Zoltan person said that he was in jail for eight months for petty crimes. Wow. And then that was when he was released. He attempted suicide. When it was unsuccessful, he realized he was alive for a larger reason, to make the community better. I mean, homie sounds kind of slightly nutty, but at the same time, that last thought, like to make the community better, is really endearing. Yeah. Some people are capable of being reformed. Yeah. It's like that weird game, like he's a seven, but he was a prior convict who cleaned up his act. What you going to do? You know, <laughs> are you still going to date him? <laughs> yeah, I think we're on, we're not on the same dating app, Cicela. I'm not on any app, so you're probably right. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not on any either. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we're happy. That's why we're hermits. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're hermits and happy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Actually, since yours is kind of um, short, because uh, mine is going to run a little bit longer than I wanted it to, I did just want to give a couple of updates. Absolutely. So I did reach out to Cesar. Remember in the episode that we're talking about the Border Patrol and how Bowie High School sued them? Yes. He did provide me with some information about his grandfather. Oh, exciting. The IRS. Yes. Yes. I haven't had a chance to go through it because he sent me, like I guess, like a news article about it. But um, just wanted to let you all know if you guys were waiting to hear about that. He just actually sent it to me yesterday. But in his defense, I barely told him about it yesterday. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, cool. But yeah, I'll go ahead and go through it and research it just to make sure that I, I'm not giving false information about that. We also did have a comment on Patreon from Eric uh, regarding one of the episodes that we did, the one about the Cobalt 40 and Juarez. Oh, yeah. This last one that was released. Yes. So I followed up with him and he did uh, say it was okay for us to to talk about it. Ooh. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and summarize a little bit here. He said that he did love the episode. He says that he's gone back and started listening to some of our older ones on YouTube. Oh, God bless you, because those are rough. Yeah, some of those are rough. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about it in, on the next episode. Okay. And he says that he's totally hooked with our podcast. Aww. He had visited Chernobyl twice 
So he loves stories that talk about radiation. And um, without going into a lot of details, he thinks that his current health situation is probably due to him visiting there. But despite that, if given the opportunity, he would go back again. And uh, I'm going to stop summarizing there and I'm going to read what he said from here on on. He says, one thing people don't understand about radiation poisoning is high doses are quickly lethal, but medium and medium high levels affect slowly, unless with rapid cellular growth, as in pregnancies. But there are also different types of radiation, so the delivery driver probably suffered long-term effects. Remember, we're talking about how this guy could have been exposed to so much radiation and you know nothing seemingly happened to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he probably did have long-term effects, but since he was exposed to it, not at once, it probably didn't kill him. So that was kind of what my theory was, and he kind of confirmed that. Wow, that is very interesting. He also says that I'm just amazed at how close we were allowed to get up to hot spots in Chernobyl and driving through the Red Forest. And he actually shared some pictures of the Red Forest, which I don't know if you're familiar with those, but they're forests like you know any forests that you're used to seeing, but they're... I wouldn't go as far as to say that they're red, but again, my uh, colors are not that great. They look more like purplish to me. And I'll um, I'll put a couple of those pictures. I'll ask them if it's okay if we can post them, and I'll put them in the show notes of this one on the Patreon. Unfortunately, I can't put them on the regular show notes because for some reason, Spotify doesn't allow that. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that's really... Wow, I really want to see those pictures. Yeah, he said it's crazy how he might have some serious health problems because of it. And he actually stayed there for a couple of days. So that's why he thinks that he might have had some of the issues that he's going through because of that. Oh, wow. It's not something you want to fuck around with. Yeah, exactly. Jeez. Wow. Yeah, I had heard about the tourism that there is in Japan for their, I guess they had some kind of an accident, we'll say, over there. And it's, it's on a Netflix show. I don't know if they still have it. It's called Dark Tourist. And it's really cool because it's just tourism, but like kind of weird, fucked up tourism. <laughs> but yeah, they were they were all concerned because they were like, hey, like our counters are like off the charts. Like, should we even be here? I don't know. It does seem like they kind of push the envelope a little bit. Was that from the nuclear meltdown they had after the tsunami or was it when we bombed them or when the U.S. bombed them? I, I want to completely divorce myself from the we when the U.S. bombed them. Yeah, I think. I think it's the one from the U.S. I can't even remember, to be honest. Hiroshima? Yeah, I'm not even sure. Or Nagasaki. Yeah, yeah there were two bombings. Yeah, sadly. Yeah, but anyway, um, it's a very interesting episode, in case you guys want to watch it. That does sound very interesting, indeed. Yeah, and, and they're short, too. Maybe I'll check it out after I watch Baby Panda or whatever that show was. I don't, <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. Callate. <laughs> That's funny. Well, anything else to add? Uh, any surprising highlights or anything you want to chat about the uh, crazy monk? No, just the surprising lowlights, but I think those are no surprise, so probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, well, thanks, Jesus. <laughs> All right. Before we go, we have to shout out our wonderful bomb-ass patrons, Sophia, Natasha, Eric, Angie, Eli. Eli. <laughs> Madtown Charity, Katya, Victor, and Christine. And Josh. Oh my goodness, and Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so, so much. Like I said, it always makes things a little bit easier doing what we love to do because of you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you want to join, go to patreon.com slash technically a conversation. It's only $2 a month. And you get the episodes a week early and ad-free. Get those little messy things out of here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention, you also get some really cool stickers. And you get to vote on the stickers. It's like all kinds of fun, guys. Yeah. And sometimes we'll include little snippets that are removed from the main episode. And we throw them up on Patreon. That's how you guys can check them out. Yeah. Behind the scenes. It's a BTSP, behind the scenes, pendejadas. That's what I like. I'm just kidding. It's terrible. <laughs> well, congratulations, lovelies. You have done it again, folks. You've learned along with us how even a hermit monk living alone in a cave ironically attracted followers. <laughs> and some really kind, albeit wacky guys that were living like true life 
Batman or Batman. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you've been enjoyed by our chat and invite you to join us again next week. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review, tell a friend, and subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. Yeah. Follow us on all the socials at greetings TAC. Email us at greetings TAC at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 915 317 66 69 if you have a story when you were a Batman to share with us. Or a hermit Aww. living in a cave Ooh. who was murdered by bad men. Oh, no. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> That was quite the roller coaster, right? <laughs> <laughs> or leave us a voice. <laughs> Sorry. On next week's episode of Technically a Conversation. In 1997, Chris Hansen, a chemist working for 3M, was asked to test the blood of employees for chemical contamination, specifically floral chemicals found in Scotchgard, Scotchban, food packaging material, and firefighting foam. Hansen was told the chemicals had found their way in several 3M employees, and while the chemicals were harmless, they wanted to see how widespread it was. Her control samples came from the American Red Cross. After running the employee's blood through a spectrometer, she confirmed the presence of the chemicals. She also ran the control samples through the spectrometer and found that they were also contaminated. Thinking her results were incorrect, her team spent several days analyzing more blood and they all showed the same results. She ordered blood from other parts of the world and from animals, all contaminated. The first blood sample that came out negative was a sample collected prior to the invention of floral chemicals in the 1940s. Is this chemical as harmless as 3M claimed or was its danger a giant cover-up? New episodes drop Monday. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show.